Tony. Tony's so glad to see him this morning. Hey there. Be still. There is a healer. His love. It's deeper than the sea. His mercy is unfailing. His arms, fortress for the weak. Let faith arise. Let faith arise. There is a river that flows Calvary Street. A fountain for the thirsty. His grace that washes over me. Faith arise, then faith arise. that you will uh, speak to our hearts, that you will, uh, just, just as we sang about just a minute ago, that we will be reminded of your faithfulness, God. That even now you'll begin to call to mind some, some places where we've seen you work, we've seen your power, we've seen your, your hand moving. 
where we, we've seen you uh, maybe deliver us out of certain situations. We've seen your presence with us through times that, uh, that may have been dark in our lives, but you were there with us. God, help us to, to remember. Because God, we know that it's in these uh, remembrances that we can step forward. We can use these remembrances as a, as a platform, as a foundation from which we can step forward into maybe, maybe a new life of faith. A, a stronger area in which we uh, turn our hearts over to you. And so God, we ask that you uh, just help us to remember. And, and we want to take it a step further and not just remember. But God, we want to be grateful. We want to be able to say thank you to you. And so we want to do that right now in the... Uh, in a moment of silent prayer, God, help us to remember and to say thank you to you. God, thank you so much for all these ways that you uh, move in our lives. I pray that you will uh, help us to, uh, to step out in faith and in whatever area it is that you're calling us to, whether it's to uh, walk across the room and, and talk to someone and invite them to, to come to church, or if it's to uh, walk across the, the cul-de-sac and, and to, to provide help to someone, or to serve in some kind of ministry, or Maybe just bring an encouraging word to someone. Whatever it is that you're calling us to, God, give us the faith to do that. Help us to uh, follow you in, in your, your plan for us here and helping people meet, know, and serve your son, Jesus. And God, as we join together in that task, now we uh, join together with our hearts and voices as together we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray by praying, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and power, and glory forever. Amen. Well, good morning. Right. It is so good to see all of you gathered here today, and uh, I want to say good morning to those watching online. Uh, for those of you who are here, you may not realize we actually uh, have groups of people that are kind of spread out around that are that are starting to, to become little communities of faith watching the, our services online, so they're kind of joining with us in worship. There's a group of folks who are at law school that every Wednesday they get together and they, they watch the services here and join us in worship. So let's uh, let's let's say hi to them, everybody. Let's say, hey, all right. I hope you guys are here. So uh, uh, it, that's really exciting the way God is kind of using this sense of, of connectedness and that his spirit is not just confined to what's going on in this room, but it's, it's present in all the churches around and, and present in, even in these groups where folks are meeting in, in uh, kind of unlikely places. But uh, it's exciting uh, for us to be gathered here today. If you're here for the first time this morning, thank you so much for coming. We are so glad that you're here. Um, if you are here for the first time, maybe the first, second, or third time, take, a, take one of those yellow cards out of the rack in front of you and, and uh, fill one of those out, if you will, for us please, and you can just drop that in the basket in a few moments. Um, if you have any questions about some of the ministries that go on here at Edgewater, or if you have a prayer request, or if you're interested in coming to our, our charge conference, which is our uh, uh, church meeting that's coming up next Sunday, you'll see that in the bulletin, uh, you can just write that on one of those blue cards, and those will go in the baskets as well. Um, be sure to look through the bulletin. There are lots of really important things going on, uh, lots of ways that we can get plugged in and connected, um, so please be sure to take some time to look at that. A um, couple of things that are not in the bulletin that I wanted to make sure that you are aware of. Um, in, in, um, if you are here last week, we showed a video about Stephen's ministry, a, a kind of time where if someone's going through a crisis time in their lives, uh, we can have someone kind of come alongside that person and, and walk with them through this difficult time, maybe an upcoming surgery or, or a loss of a spouse or, or just 
some difficult times, all sorts of things. But we're looking for folks to be those Stevens ministers. And now, um, it's not something that we just say, oh, great, good, here's a list of people to go visit. That's not how we do it. There's all sorts of training and support that comes along with it. So if you're interested in finding out a little bit more about it, there's a table directly across the hall. Uh, you, can, you can stop over there and, uh, and talk to them about that. Also, over these next couple of weeks, we're going to be having a, a little bit of a, a, a focus on our, our missions of the church, the things that we're doing to reach out to this uh, community and around this world. Uh, you'll see a table out in the lobby. We're collecting our little mission banks with a spare change that we have that help support some of our overseas missions. Um, also, we're going to be doing another um, uh, Habitat for Humanity Apostles build. What that is is 12 churches are getting together to build a, a, a Habitat for Humanity house in this community. And we're one of those churches. And so if you're interested in maybe helping out with that, doing some of the physical labor, um, there's a, a table out in the lobby where they're collecting the missions banks. You can sign up for that. Or you can, um, uh, or if you're interested in maybe giving financially to help support that, you can do that as well. Um, how many of you were here uh, this, this past Saturday, yesterday, for Go? All right. Good deal. It was a, a great day. We had a wonderful time here. Um, we were actually able to serve about 125 families. Uh, we And one new table that we had set up is, was Toys for Tots. We were able to sign 29 families up to receive Christmas presents through Toys for Tots. So pretty excited about that. And uh, also, uh, we do free haircuts. And, and we're actually now beginning to partner with the Votech around the corner, uh, where they have folks who are training in, in, in cutting hair and doing makeovers and stuff like that. And, they, and we've set up a system of of taking some vouchers and we're able to then give those to folks. Maybe they're getting ready for a job interview that week and they want to make sure that, that they look really, really nice for that. They can take that over there and get that done. So uh, it's, it's just a really exciting thing, the way that we're able to just reach out and, and connect with our community and show God's love in, in some really practical ways. Um, one other thing that I, I just wanted to be sure to, to bring up, um, it, for those of you who uh, like Christian music, uh, there, there's a, a group called Big Daddy Need. And they, they've yeah, done uh, many popular songs that are out there on the radio. There's a concert coming up on Thursday night. And uh, actually, there's, there's someone here who has four tickets that are on sale for, I think they're 10 bucks a piece. And they actually include uh, backstage, or uh, early admission is what it is. Sorry, I don't want to get you like wandering around in the dressing room and they arrest you or something. No, it's, it's early admission. And uh, Brian is back in the back over there. And, and so if you're interested in those tickets, you can talk to Brian. The concert's this Thursday evening, and, uh, and he has those tickets. Well, um, the ushers are ready to come through with the baskets. If you have uh, um, those cards filled out and ready to go. Also, if you helped out at Go or maybe involved in some other ministry here in this church or out in this community, or if you just took a walk across the room to help people meet, know, and serve Jesus Christ, to pull out one of those salty service cards, one of those white cards. You can pull that out, drop that in the basket as well. This is also the time for our uh, to bring our tithes and offerings before God to say thank you to Him for the wonderful way that He works and moves in our lives. To give back to him a portion of what he's given to us in the first place. So I'm going to ask the ushers now to please come forward to receive this morning's honor. I fall so hard, but you Okay, well, uh, this morning we are continuing our series uh, entitled The Sickness Within. It comes to us from Life Church. If you've been here over the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about some of the, uh, the core issues that, that we struggle with. The first week we talked about anger. And then the next week we talked about envy. And, and last week, I tell you what, if you were not here, we talked about pride. It was the best sermon ever. <laughs> I didn't learn anything from it. So, uh, uh, just joking. Um, but today we're going to be talking about the issue of control. And it was very funny that, that I had people who came up to me before last service and, and they saw that the topic was on control and they were like, well, we don't think you should be preaching about this. And it's like, well, stop controlling. No, they were joking. So uh, <laughs> anyhow, let's, uh, let's take a moment. Before we get into what God has in store for us this morning, let's take a moment. Let's pray together, please. God, thank you for this time together this morning. I pray that you will give me the words to say that you want me to say. You will help us to hear what you want us to hear. You will give us the courage and the strength to act. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, uh, the dictionary.com definition of a control freak is uh, a person with an obsessive need to be in control of what is happening. Okay, a person with an obsessive need to be in control of what is happening. So my question for you as we start off today is, uh, 
Raise your hand if you know someone else who struggles with the issue of control. <laughs> okay? And now, raise your hand if you are that person. Now, now if you're raising someone else's hand, if you are raising someone else's hand, you are sick. Um, there, there is no hope for you this morning. Uh, you've got some serious issues with it. Uh, so, uh, so some of you may think, well, you know, I don't know if I am or not. Well, how, how can I know if I'm a control freak? Well, a, a couple, couple tips. You, you, if you may be a control freak, if you, if you're someone who showers with your little Bluetooth headset on, you might have some control issues. Um, if you, if you go to PetSmart and you buy a leash for your dog and one for your spouse and one for your kids, you may be a little bit of a control freak. If uh, if, if you cannot watch television without having the clicker in your hand, uh, you, you may be dealing with some control issues. Uh, so uh, so what, what do we do? We, we, we all deal with these control issues. We try to control our spouse's schedule, our, our, our spouse's spending. We try to control the, the decisions that our friends make. And if they don't make the decision that we wanted them to do, what do we do? We go around and we, we gossip about them and say, well, that person is not a very good decision maker. And uh, we, we, we try to control the creativity of our employees. We, we try to control our kids, and, and, and the list goes on and on. And year after year after year, what do we try to do? We try to control God's plan in our lives. So, so you, you, you may not understand it, but I, I, I think that there is really that depth of this sickness within, inside each and every one of us. Now, we, we may try to pretty it up a little bit and put a little mask on, and, and, and we may say, well, you know, I'm, I'm just wired that way. It, it's part of my personality. I'm a type A driven personality, so that's just part of who I am. Or you might say, well, no, I'm, I'm just very organized. It, it's not control, it's organization. Or you may say, well, it, it, it's loyalty, or, or I, I'm just caring about other people. We, we try to make it look nice. But the reality is, is that I think if we were to strip all those layers off and kind of get down to the core of what it is, I think each and every one of us struggles with control issues in one way or another. So, so today what we're going to do um, is, is we're going to look at the confessions of a control freak. And uh, we, we talked about this story last week in regards to pride, but we're going to be looking at the story of King David again. And we're going to kind of come at it from a little bit of a different angle than we did last week. And we're going to begin to see kind of what an obsessive control freak King David actually was. So if, if you're uh, not familiar with the story, basically uh, King David was the second king of Israel. He had been uh, anointed, chosen by God. God put him in this position. Scripture actually describes David as, as a man after God's own heart. Um, one day he kind of sends his armies to go out to battle and he, he stays behind and he, he's walking around the rooftop of the palace uh, looking over the skyline of Israel and, and he looks over and he, and he sees over on a rooftop a couple couple blocks over he sees Bathsheba bathing on top of the roof. Now what she's doing, taking a bath on top of the roof, I don't know. But, um, but basically he, he goes and he grabs one of his secret service agents and he says, okay, listen, go get that lady. I, I, I want her here with me. And so, so they bring her back and, and, he, and David meets Bathsheba and, and they, they get into stuff they shouldn't be getting into and, and he sends her home, hopefully to never hear from her again. But, but then all of a sudden he, he gets an email that's marked high importance and, uh, and so he goes to his inbox and he's looking at it and it says, hey, David, this is Bathsheba. Uh, do you remember the other night? Well, uh, here's the deal. I'm pregnant. Um, so, so King David, this guy who scripture describes as a man after God's own heart, God, God specifically and strategically put him in this position. And now he's messed up and he has messed up big time. So what does he do? He's kind of he's freaking out and he's going, oh, man, I, I'm going to get caught. I'm going to get found out. What's going to happen? And so, so he pulls out his cell phone. He calls Uriah. Uriah's out of the battlefield. He says, Uriah, come on back to the palace. Come on. I want to hang out with you for a little bit. You, you've done such a great job. So, so Uriah comes back, and, and he's at the palace with King David. And King David says, uh, well, you know, you, you've done such a great job. You're such a good soldier. I want to give you a couple days in our, of R&R. &R. Why don't you go and, and, and just uh, spend some time with your wife? And David's thinking, okay, good. I've got, got my tracks covered there. I, I don't have to worry about it anymore. But, but what does Uriah say back to King David? We read about this in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 11. It says, Uriah replied, The ark and the armies of Israel and Judah are living in tents, and Joab and his officers are camping in the open field. How could I go home to wine and dine and sleep with my wife? I swear that I will never be guilty of acting like that. 
So you've got Uriah, who's this man of character and integrity, and you've got David, who's this raging control freak. And, and, and he looks, he, Uriah looks right at David, he says, you know, I'm loyal to you, I'm loyal to the kingdom, I'm not going to do it. And David's freaking out. He's like, no, just come on, go home. And, and, but, but he doesn't. And so David says, well, i got to come up with another strategy. So, so he invites him over the next night, and, and they have this big meal, and he gets him drunk. Again, David's trying to control and manipulate the situation. And, and, and he sends him home for a little bit of time with his wife. And, and uh, he, David's thinking, oh, good, now finally it'll all be over. But what does Uriah do? He goes out, and he, he spends the night on a mat on the floor with, with the other servants of the palace. And... Uh, so, so David, again, he's freaking out. He doesn't know what to do. Plan A didn't work. Plan B didn't work. So now what's he going to do? Well, this is what he does in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 14 and 15. So, so the next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and gave it to Uriah to deliver. The letter instructed Joab, station Uriah on the front lines where the battle is fiercest, then pull back so that he will be killed. So... So a control freak, and it played itself all the way out to the end result of having someone killed. So, so if, if sometimes this, this control issue that we struggle with, if that sometimes can be the end result, what, where does it start? What, what, what can be at the root of this control that we struggle with? Well, if, if, if you have your bulletin, you may want to take it out on the back side. There's a place to write down some notes if you'd like to. Um, but I think a lot of times the root cause of our control is, is fear. Our, our fear causes us to control. Our fear causes us to control. David was scared. He was absolutely scared out of his mind. He, he, was, he, he was afraid he was going to get caught. He was afraid he was going to disappoint God. He was afraid that, that all of this would, would come out and his reputation would be trashed. He, he was a, afraid that, uh, that he was going to be labeled as a, a, an adulterer and a murderer. He, he, was, he was doing everything he could to manipulate the situation and get, control the situation because he was absolutely in the grip of fear. It, David wrote uh, a lot of the, the, the psalms that we find in the Bible. And one of the psalms that he wrote after uh, this had occurred was uh, Psalm 55. And in, in Psalm 55, 5, this is what we read. It says, fear and trembling overwhelm me. I can't stop shaking. Today, here in this room, we have people who, who are absolutely gripped by fear. You're, you're feel, fearful that you're going to be found out. You're, you're fearful of what the doctor's going to say. You're fearful that your marriage isn't going to make it. You're fearful that your kids aren't going to turn out right. And, and so what do we do? We try to control the situation. We say, you know, I can fix it. I, I can take care of it. I, I can do it. I, I, can, I can control this. I, I can just try a little harder and, and control the situation. If you go to Amazon.com, you'll find hundreds and hundreds of books all about how to control. How, how, to, how to control your finances, how to control the bugs in your house, how to control the weeds in your yard, how to control your mind, how to control your spouse's mind. Um, I see some of y'all going, oh, good. I'll that one. <laughs> how to control everything, because we, we live in a nation that is obsessed with control. I want to be in charge. I want to be in control. And so, so what we're going to do today is we're going to try to take things in the other direction. In, instead, of, instead of being totally in control, we're going to talk a little bit about how we can lose control. How, how to let go and, and stop having to try to control every single situation that's going on. And, and so, uh, especially when we try to control the lives of the people around us. And, and so if you're taking notes, uh, you may want to write this down. The first thing, if you want to lose control, the first thing you have to do is you have to surrender your fear. Surrender your fear. There may be some of you here today and you're dealing with the fear of rejection. Uh, you're, you're afraid that you're going to be rejected by your boss or your spouse or your friends or maybe a parent. And, and so what you do is you try to control the situation. You try to exaggerate details to your boss to help control their opinion of you. You, you try to, um, you, you, there may be some folks who, who you serve your spouse day in and day out like a slave to control their opinion of you. Uh, there, there may be some, some men out there that are still trying to get your father's approval. That you, you have this insatiable appetite for that pat on the back from your dad. 
And, and so you work late hours and you buy things you can't afford. And, and all to get the approval of your dad to control his opinion of you. There are others of you that are dealing with the fear of failure. You're, you're absolutely scared to death of failing financially. And so, so you create this, this strict, rigid, unreasonable budget. There are others of you that you're afraid of being single for the rest of your life. And so you try to control the people around you. Others of you, you're, you're afraid of failing as a parent. And so, so what do you do? You, you try to manipulate and control every decision that your, that your children make uh, about, about the places they go, what time they have to be in, what they can wear, um, what, where they're going with, who they're going with, all of this. And, and you're probably thinking, well, I'm, I'm just being a good parent. And, and to some degree you are. But, but far too often we have a tendency to parent out of our fear of failing as a parent. Then there are others of you that are just dealing with the general kind of fear of the unknown. Maybe some you're afraid you're going to get caught. And so, so you manipulate and you control just like King David did. There may be some of you here today that, that God has called you to take a step of faith. He's called you into a ministry of some sort. And, and you're kind of running away from it. You're not taking those steps. You're, you're controlling your life, not doing what it is that God's calling you to do. And it's time to surrender your fear. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. It says, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Now, now those words, do not fear, that we saw at the beginning of this verse, those, those words, do not fear, are mentioned 365 times in the Bible. Kind of convenient. One, one for each day of the year. And then you know what? Also, if, if, if I'm going to tell you something 365 times, it probably means I think you ought to listen. There, there's probably something important there. And, and so that's the message that's coming through. I think that uh, it's also interesting to see that it doesn't say, well, you know, if you sort of feel like it, then maybe don't be afraid sometimes. That's not what it says. It's a command. It says, do not fear. It, it's non-negotiable. It's the Spirit of God. Of, working through his word to pour into your life. You've got to let it soak into you. You've got to let it change and transform your life. Do not fear. Do not fear. Oh, but, but my kids, they're... No, do not fear. Well, well, you don't know my financial situation. No, do not fear. Well, well my doctor the other day said, no, do not fear. Why? Because God says, I am with you. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. <laughs> we, we sometimes have a tendency to forget that at the moment that we receive Jesus Christ into our lives, something supernatural happened. Something about us changed. We were transformed. The Spirit of God invaded our lives. And we will never be the same. And now when we begin to fear, we have the Spirit of God inside of us that allows us to be able to deal with that fear and push that fear out of our lives. So, so if you want to control, if you want to lose control of your life, if you want to lose control, you need to surrender your fear. What, what fear has come to your mind today that you need to surrender? Let, let go and surrender that fear to God. So back to the story, King David is over, over there and he, he's, he's just totally off the rails now. Um, um, he's, he's lost it. Um, and, and you've got this guy, Nathan. Nathan is a prophet, kind of like the, the pastor of Israel. And, uh, and he's talking to God one day and God says, uh, Nathan, I've got a, a little job for you. Um, David, he, he's messed up. He messed up big time. Um, and and he's, he's arrogant right now. He's, he's a raging control freak. And, and I need you to take your finger and I need you to put it on the sin in his life. And I need you to say, you know, King David, this is what you're doing. You need to confess it and you need to repent. Now I'm thinking that probably at this point Nathan might have, might have been able to say, you know, God, you know, this, King David, he's on the edge right now. This is the most powerful guy in the region. And you want me to go up to him and, and say, um, sir, there's, there's something in your life that's wrong and you need to fix it. 
he, he could have said, oh, no, God, I'm done. I'm out of here. I'm, I'm not going to do that. There's no way I, I can pull that off. You need to find someone else. But Nathan didn't do that. Nathan didn't argue with God. What did he do? Nathan surrendered the details to God. He allowed those details to say, you know, God, you're going to take care of that. If this is what you're calling me to do, this is what I'm going to do. He surrendered the details and did exactly what God needed him to do. And so if you want to lose control in your life, the point number two is you need to surrender the details. Surrender the details. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. I love these verses. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will direct your paths. Trust God with the details. He, he is the object of our trust. We, we don't put our trust in the doctor's report. We don't put our trust in uh, our kids that they're going to turn out all right. We put our trust in God because he's the one who has control over these things in our lives. Are, are you going to trust God only when, when the, the answer comes out the way we want it to? We have a tendency to do that sometimes. But I, I, I think we need to step back and see that God has, has a bigger picture. God is in control. God knows the things that are going on in our lives. And God has control over these things. God has control over, over, over these things. And we need to, so we need to surrender these details to God. Why do we need to do that? Um, well, let's look at Psalm 91, verse 1. Where it says, Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Now, the word almighty in the original language is El Elyon, El Elyon, which means, um, which means uh, the sovereign God. Basically, we could say that the God who is in control of everything. You know, he, God is not asleep at the wheel. When bad stuff goes on in our lives, we have to realize that God can work through that in spite of what's going on. Nothing that goes on in our lives surprises God. It's not like God woke up one morning and goes, oh, wow, you've got marriage problems. Oh, uh, unbelievable. And <laughs> nothing surprises him. God's in control of everything. We have to trust him with, with, the, with the visible things, the things that, that, that we see in our lives. He, he's in control of the visible. He's in control of your small group or your Bible study or your Sunday school class. He's in control of your vacation. He's in control of your cancer. He's in control of your marriage. He's in control of your finances. He's in control of your kids. He is in control. But he's also in control of the things that we can't see. The, the invisible things. The, the things that are going to happen in our future. God, God's in control of, of the marriage problems that you're going to have next month. For, for those of you who are, are maybe struggling with, with having kids, God's in charge of that. He's in control of that. He's in control. Even though you may not know that you're going to lose your job a year from now, God is in control. So we have to understand that, that he's in control of the things today and control of the things that haven't happened yet. And, and, and what we need to do is we need to surrender those details to him because what do we do? We try to control all of these things. We try to hang on to these things. We try to direct the course and, and we end up so often just, uh, one, annoying the crud out of people around us by trying to control them. But, but we also then, we, 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 we go off on these wrong paths and we end up in the ditch so often because we're just trying to control everything. And you know how much impact we actually have? on these things, especially in the future, it's nothing. We need to surrender these details to the one who has absolute control. And that's God. So if you want to lose control, you need to surrender the details to him. And the third thing, if you want to lose control, you need to surrender your life. Surrender your life. Um, so, so Nathan goes to confront King David. I'm sure he's probably scared out of his mind at that point. But uh, he walks into the king's chambers like we talked about last week. He puts his finger out and he points at David and he says, you are that man. You are that man. And what does King David do at that point? Like I mentioned earlier, King David wrote a lot of the Psalms. And, and Psalm 51 is one that, that uh, it was, was written right after all of this happened, uh, after, after this conversation. And this is how that Psalm starts off in verses 1 and 2. Says, have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. David surrendered. He said, he said, you know, God, forgive me for my sins. Forgive me from being this raging control. 
He, he surrendered the details to God. He surrendered his, his kingdom. He didn't know what was going to happen in the future. He, he, he surrendered his shame. He said, you know, God, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. You're the one that I want to that I want to honor with my life. David surrendered everything that he had to God. Now, the other night I was lying in bed and I was watching uh, ESPN and, and uh, one of those poker tournaments came on. I don't know when poker became a sport, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, but it was on ESPN, so I watched it for a while. And, uh, and it's quite a cast of characters that you find on, on those shows. Uh, You've got, you've got the, the guy who's, who's there, this really competent guy wearing the big dark shades so no one can see his eyes. And he's got the pinky ring and all the gold chains and he's smacking his gum and he's got this big old, big old pile of chips in front of him. And, uh, and, and, and then there's this other guy who's very meticulous about it all. He's got all his chips organized by color and stacked the same height and, and, and he's, he's intently watching what everyone else is doing. Kind of, you can see him trying to count the cards and, and kind of control what's going on at the table. And you've got this other, this other guy who's kind of like the drama queen who anytime there's a big decision that comes up, he backs up from the table and is like, oh, what am I going to do? And, 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 and then, and then you've got the, the guy who's like the risk taker. That, that every, every time it seems like he's just going all in, taking these big risks. And uh, in, in, in a weird way, this is kind of a mirror for our spiritual journey. I, I know you're thinking, where on earth is he going with that? Um, but uh, don't trust me here. Um, so, so my question then is, which of those guys are you? Which of those guys are you? Are you the one who has a million chips sitting in front of you? And you say, here, God, I'll give you a thousand. I'll give you a whole thousand. You know, I'll, I'll go to church on Sundays. But you know, really, that, that's pretty much about it. That, that's all I'm willing to give. God, everything else uh, I'm, is mine. I'm hanging up on the all the rest of or are you, are you the guy who's, who's kind of meticulous and he's got everything counted out and very measured and you split it evenly in half? You say, well, God, I will give you, I will give you half. Okay, tell you what, you, you can have my weekends. I'll, 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 I go to church and then, and then I, I'll, I'll be a part of a small group, something like that. But God, you know, everything else, uh, don't mess with it. Don't, don't mess with uh, what's going on in the rest of my life. Don't mess with my private thoughts. Don't mess with, um, with the, 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 my selfishness in my marriage. Those things, God, those, those, I'm going to hang on to those. You, you can have that other half. Or, or maybe you're the guy who's sitting at that table and just agonizing over the decision to make. And then maybe finally you just walk away from the table and say, you know, God, all, all these are mine. All these chips are mine. I've been there before. I've done the religious thing. I've been to church. I've been hurt. I've been burned. And you know, I'm not going to do it. All of these are mine. Or are you the guy who takes the risk? Who's willing to say, you know what? I'm all in. I'm all in. God, I'm, I'm not going to try to control any longer. God, I'm all in. For you. <laughs> take it all. Take my kids. Take my job. Take my life. Take absolutely everything that I am. If you truly want to lose control, then you have to surrender your life. Because God, God wants everything. Are you all in? It's crazy. It's crazy. God, I come to you right now and I pray that, uh, that we would all be able to make that decision. To be able to be all in for you. That we would uh, surrender our life. That we would surrender this this absolute control in, in all areas of our lives to you. And maybe you're here today and, and maybe you're a follower of Christ and, and you've made that decision to follow him and, but you're dealing with some serious issues of control. You're trying to control your kids. You're trying to control your in-laws. You're trying to control your, your finances. trying to control your health and you just can't keep up with it anymore. And I think today God is saying to you, surrender. Surrender surrender it to me. You've got to let it go. Or maybe you've got some fear in your life that you're afraid to, to let go. You don't, maybe you don't know what it means for you to let, let go. Maybe, maybe it means that when these issues come up that you have to take those thoughts captive every day. Maybe for you it means that you need to uh, go and ask somebody for forgiveness for how controlling you've been. And the list goes on and on, but the, the reality is, is that you need to let go of it today. 
Maybe today is that day that, that you're going to surrender your life. Maybe you've never made that commitment to, uh, to follow him. And, uh, to, to say, God, I'm all in. I'm going to encourage you to do that. And God, I pray that uh, if that's the case for some folks here, that they would know your love for them, that they'd be able to hear your voice calling to them, that they'd be able to just say with their whole hearts, God, forgive me of the things that I've done wrong. Forgive me of my sin. Restore me into relationship with you. Uh, show me what it means to, to live this, this new life. But God, I also know that, uh, that there are uh, those, there's some of us here today who just say, you know, God, I'm, I am half in for you. And God, I pray that you uh, maybe show us areas in our lives that we've been holding back. Point that out to us. And so that today can be the day that we, that we just shove the whole pile of chips, the chips of our life, to be able to say, you know, God, I'm all in for you. God, we ask that you speak to our hearts during this time. We thank you and we ask this in Jesus. Well, the altar is going to be open if you'd like to come and spend some time in prayer here. Uh, let's just take some time to reflect on that. Sing along with us.
to take that step to, to, to turn your life over to Him. For those of you who maybe have made that commitment, but you know there, there's still some pieces missing. There's still some, some things that we're holding back from God. I encourage you to just open your heart to Him. Uh, allow Him. He, he's not doing it because God's this ultimate control freak. And as, a, as a matter of fact, to think of it, God it kind of sets the example for us in, in losing control. Because God being God, He could have created all of us as as, as like mindless robots that just went around worshiping him. But no, what did he do? He, he released control and gave us free choice to, to be able to choose whether or not we were going to love him. And, and Jesus set that example for us. Jesus could have stayed up in heaven and controlled that, but instead he came down to earth. Even when he was there nailed to the cross for our sins, he could have said, you know, I, I, I'm done with this. This is enough for me. I, I've had enough for today. And he could have taken control and gone. But no, he followed it through to the end. For you and for me. And so, so we need to have that Christ-like example in our hearts of being able to, to relinquish control. To be able to, to take the, the grip off our family and friends. That, that we try to manipulate situations around us. And, and trust God. To, to surrender whatever fear we have. To, to allow Him to work through that. To, to surrender the details to God. And ultimately, to surrender our lives. To be able to follow Him on this grand adventure that He has in store. So as we close our time together today, let's stand, let's sing. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay.